Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is Pathophysiology of Respiratory Distress Syndromes. Uh, so there are two entities I'll be addressing in this video, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, uh, which is covered in the pulmonary chapter of Robin's uh, Pathology, and Neonatal Respiratory Distress Syndrome, which is covered in the Pediatrics and Genetics chapter of Robin's Pathology. I'm putting these together because they have similar uh, findings regarding the pathophysiology and morphologic findings, and I think it's useful uh, to uh, do this compare and contrast to help accentuate uh, what they have in common so that you will understand uh, these two very important diseases. So let's begin with neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, which is also known as hyaline membrane disease. We're going to see hyaline membranes again in acute respiratory distress syndrome as well. Now, neonatal RDS uh, has increasing incidence with decreasing gestational age. So it's only at about 1% at 37 weeks gestation, about 93% at 20 week, in 28 weeks and below. And the pathogenesis is uh, quite well understood. It's due to uh, pulmonary immaturity and surfactant deficiency. So let's take a moment to reflect on what surfactant does. So surfactant is going to decrease the surface tension of the air liquid barrier in the alveoli. And uh, it's going to uh, really ramp up in production uh, by those type two pneumocytes at about the 35th week of gestation. Now, the reason is, is that first breath that uh, the infant takes is going to require high inspiratory pressures to expand both lungs because they are, are wet and heavy and airless. After they have had that first inspiratory breath, surfactant is going to keep the alveoli patent and aerated, so it will take less pressure for subsequent breaths. This is a good thing. Now, with a, a premature infant, we're not going to have a sufficient surfactant. So the lungs are going to collapse with each successive breath, leading to atelectasis. This is uh, what you will see with an infant in neonatal RDS, is that they'll be laboring to breathe because they have to use extraordinary effort to open the lungs with each successive breath because they are lacking that surfactant. Uh, this is going to result in uneven uh, perfusion and hypoventilation with hypoxemia and carbon dioxide retention leading to a respiratory acidosis. In response to this respiratory acidosis, we're going to get pulmonary vasoconstriction and hypoperfusion, which is going to result in uh, downstream endothelial and epithelial damage. When we have this injury, plasma will leak into the alveoli and we will get this uh, gummy mess of fibrin and necrotic cells that form these hyaline membranes that will form an additional barrier to gas exchange. Remember, even without these hyaline membranes, we're having challenges because we have ventilation perfusion mismatch, we have areas of atelectasis. Now let's look at this in a beautiful figure uh, from Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. This really puts it all together and also sets us up for understanding acute respiratory distress syndrome. So here uh, we have our alveolus. Here's our little bright green uh, type 2 pneumocyte. Here's our uh, pink type 1 pneumocyte. And here is our capillary. Uh, because uh, this is a premature uh, infant, we have redu uh, reduced surfactant synthesis, uh, storage, and release. Uh, this is going to res result in decreased alveolar surfactant. So this is going to increase the alveolar surface tension, leading to atelectasis and collapse of alveoli. Because of this alveolar collapse, we're going to get impaired perfusion and hypoventilation. So we don't get our gas exchange here across alveolar wall to our capillary to our little red cell. This is going to lead to hypoxemia and our carbon dioxide retention, our acidosis. Because of this acidosis, we're going to get some pulmonary vasoconstriction, leading to downstream pulmonary uh, hypoperfusion. This can cause not only endothelial damage, but epithelial damage as well. With this constellation of findings, we're going to get edema fluid leaking into our alveolus. We have our plasma uh, leakage into the alveolus, forming uh, this deposition of fibrin and necrotic cells, making this hyaline membrane, again, a barrier to gas exchange, leading to hypoxemia and uh, carbon dioxide retention. So we have this uh, cycle uh, that keeps uh, going through. So what will we see uh, morphologically? So grossly, the lungs will be uh, solid, airless, and reddish purple. They'll be quite heavy with liquid. Microscopically, we'll see areas of uh, collapsed, uh, poorly developed alveoli, as well as uh, dilated alveoli. Uh, there will be necrotic cellular debris that in some areas will form these bright pink uh, hyaline membranes. 
So here we can see a section of lung uh, with uh, neonatal RDS. You can see here we have some collapsed areas of atelectasis uh, of uh, immature lung. And then these other areas where we have these dilated alveoli with these thick uh, hyaline membranes. Now I've referred to the hyaline membranes here a couple of times. We're going to uh, move into acute respiratory distress syndrome in a moment, uh, but I just wanted to highlight for you how we see these same hyaline membranes in acute respiratory distress syndrome that we see in neonatal uh, RDS. So the clinical features of neonatal RDS depend on the maturity and birth weight of the infant as well as the promptness of therapy initiation. Uh, so if we have an infant that's born at less than 28 weeks gestation, we can give prophylactic exogenous surfactant at birth before they develop respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, we know that uh, corticosteroids increase the production of surfactant lipids and proteins. Uh, so this is actually a protective measure uh, when uh, there's intrauterine stress. Uh, this prepares uh, the fetus for uh, imminent delivery. Uh, by increasing uh, surfactant, and when you have intrauterine stress, you actually have a decreased risk of neonatal RDS. So we can take advantage of this clinically to give antenatal steroids uh, to induce uh, lung maturation when uh, delivery is imminent. There are a couple of other clinical features that are important to recognize because uh, it is uh, they can predispose uh, to uh, neonatal RDS. So insulin will decrease surfactant production. So if the uh, the birth parent uh, has uh, has diabetes, this increases the risk of neonatal RDS. Uh, labor uh, will stimulate surfactant production. So if uh, the uh, birth parent undergoes a cesarean section before the onset of labor, this increases the risk of neonatal RDS. Uh, we treat uh, these infants uh, with uh, uh, mechanical ventilation and oxygenation, uh, and we actually have a, a pretty good survival rate with neonatal RDS in contrast to what we see with acute uh, RDS, which we'll see uh, in, in typically in adult populations. The reason we have a better uh, outcome in uh, neonates is because we have a little bit of a lead time. We understand there's a premature infant. We have some uh, medical interventions we can do as well. But at the same time, we still need to oxygenate the infant. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, downstream issues that we can get. One is called retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, when the infant is on the increased oxygenation of ventilation, this is going to decrease production of vascular endothelial growth factor. When the infant is returned to room air, we'll get a rebound in the production of vascular endothelial growth factor that can lead to neovascularization of the retina. So we're working on more nuanced uh, uh, respirator or ventilator uh, settings for these uh, children. We can also see something called bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is uh, decreased alveolar septation due to a combination of factors, uh, so prematurity, uh, cytokines, vascular maldevelopment, et cetera. Now this brings us uh, to the next topic, which is going to be acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So acute lung injury is the abrupt onset of hypoxemia and bilateral pulmonary edema in the absence of cardiac failure, so non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now there are multiple different causes of acute lung injury. Uh, when acute lung injury is sufficiently severe, it may lead to what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome. The uh, definition of ARDS has been evolving along with our understanding of the pathogenesis. Uh, it's now defined as respiratory failure within one week of a known clinical insult uh, resulting in bilateral opacities on chest imaging, and this is uh, when it's not due to effusions, atelectasis, cardiac failure, or fluid overload. And we'll talk about what some of these known clinical insults are. Now, I want you to keep in mind that both uh, acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, are inflammation-induced increases in pulmonary vascular uh, permeability, edema, hyaline membranes, and epithelial cell death. They have these in common. This constellation of findings is referred to as diffuse alveolar damage, or DAD. This is something that you will uh, see frequently in the literature. This is referring to a specific finding. Uh, I've had students who are confused because they're like, well, there's a lot of alveoli that are damaged and it's diffuse, so it must be diffuse alveolar damage. When we use this term, this is, uh, these are the findings we're referring to. Now, ARDS can have a variety of different causes. Uh, these here in boldface are the most common. 
So pneumonia, sepsis, aspiration, and trauma. Here are a couple other that are mentioned in Robin's uh, and Kumar basic pathology. But I want you to recognize the wide range of etiologies. This is actually a table from Robinson Cotron, Pathologic Basis of Disease, so big Robins, because this is important for you when you're taking care of patients. Uh, so that if you have uh, a patient who's had near drowning or a fracture with fat embolism and they present with uh, dyspnea and tachypnea, this will raise your suspicion that they may be uh, beginning acute respiratory distress syndrome and you need to begin treating them. Uh, so what do we see on radiology with acute respiratory distress syndrome? Here we see those bilateral opacities. Uh, it's quite uh, uh, heterogeneous. You can see there's some areas where there's probably reasonable oxygenation, where we don't have a lot of fluid buildup, uh, and other areas that are very patchy and consolidated. Uh, so we do have a sort of a patchiness to this diffuse picture. So I'm going to describe the pathogenesis of ARDS, and then we're going to work through a figure uh, similar to what we did for neonatal RDS. So uh, in uh, ARDS, we have some sort of injury to our epithelial uh, and endothelial linings of our alveolar capillary membrane. Uh, so it can be due to sepsis or to a variety of different causes. And when we get this happening, we get the release of mediators, either from our alveolar macrophages, or they can be circulating inflammatory mediators, for example, in the setting of sepsis. This is going to cause uh, activation of our endothelium. Uh, with this activation, the endothelium is going to become uh, procoagulant. It's going to begin expressing uh, additional uh, adhesion molecules. This is going to allow neutrophils to adhere to this activated endothelium. They will extravasate into um, uh, from, they will extravasate from the blood vessel into the alveolus, where they can release their inflammatory mediators, so proteases, reactive oxygen species, and cytokines, causing injury again to our epithelial uh, linings here. Uh, with uh, endothelial activation and injury, we're going to get uh, the formation of edema, which can be interstitial or intraalveolar. And at the same time that all of this is going on, we're going to have problems with surfactant. So uh, surfactant levels may be decreased uh, because of injury to type 2 pneumocytes, so they're not, uh, they're not uh, producing surfactant. Uh, or it could be uh, that the proteases uh, that are released into the uh, alveolus uh, destroy and inactivate surfactant. Regardless, we do know that we have surfactant abnormalities that will lead to impaired alveolar gas exchange. The lungs, again, are going to become stiff, uh, and the alveoli uh, will require a lot of pressure to open them. At the same time, we have our sloughed and necrotic cells, this protein-rich fluid from our edema, leading again to our hyaline membranes. So this is uh, the figure from Robbins uh, and Kumar basic pathology on the left looking at a healthy alveolus, one in acute uh, lung injury. So what I'm going to do, since this is what we're focusing on, is we will focus on that. Uh, so here we have our acute lung injury. So uh, here we have uh, the type 1 cell that has been injured. Uh, we have, uh, perhaps because of sepsis, we also have injury to our endothelial cells. This is going to uh, result in the release of mediators. These mediators uh, here are released by this intraalveolar macrophage, so tumor necrosis factor, a variety of chemokines. We have uh, IL-1 and tumor necrosis factor, which are going to help recruit neutrophils to the alveolus. Uh, the tumor necrosis factor and chemokines will have uh, an effect on the endothelium, uh, as well as uh, bringing in our neutrophils that are going to bind to this activated endothelium, extravasate, uh, enter uh, the alveolus, begin secreting reactive oxygen species, uh, cytokines and proteases that can have an impact here on our surfactant. Uh, we have our cellular debris from our uh, necrotic cells, uh, and the edema fluid uh, from this uh, damaged uh, capillary will leak into our alveolus. Uh, these are going to form uh, our hyaline membranes, which we see here. Now, uh, when the patient uh, survives the acute phase, uh, through appropriate supportive care, they can then enter the organizing phase. And what happens here is that our macrophages will begin consuming this debris, uh, and they will be releasing uh, fibrogenic cytokines. Uh, this is going to stimulate our fibroblasts here in the uh, alveolar wall uh, to begin uh, forming uh, uh, fibrosis. So morphologically, uh, let's look at the acute phase and the organizing phase. So acutely, the, fa the findings will be very uh, similar grossly to what we see in neonatal RDS, dark, red, airless, heavy lungs. 
Microscopically, again, we'll see very similar findings with hyaline membranes, capillary congestion, necrotic alveolar epithelial cells, edema, hemorrhage, areas of atelectasis, uh, areas of dilation. In the organizing phase, we'll see uh, a proliferation of our type 2 pneumocytes, as well as fibrosis and a consequent alveolar septa thickening. So here you can see a section of uh, lung uh, with acute respiratory distress syndrome. It is a beefy red due to congestion of the capillaries. It is glistening with fluid. It's very heavy uh, and airless. Here's what we see here on the left in our acute uh, exudative phase of uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, where we have uh, quite prominently our uh, hyaline membranes. We have dilated alveoli here, and then we have some collapse uh, with atelectasis and some uh, sloughed necrotic epithelial cells here, as well as some edema fluid. This is our organizing phase where uh, you can see this proliferation of type 2 pneumocytes looking like little tombstones, uh, and then this uh, fibrosis of our intraalveolar septa. The clinical features uh, of acute respiratory distress syndrome are that you will have a patient who uh, will begin uh, expressing profound dyspnea and tachypnea with increasing respiratory failure, hypoxemia, and cyanosis. Uh, when you get uh, chest radiology, you'll see those diffuse bilateral infiltrates that I showed you earlier. Uh, and the patient uh, will be in this uh, very uh, dangerous cycle because of ventilation perfusion mismatch uh, due to our patchy distribution. This is going to, similar to what we saw in neonatal RDS, cause uh, hypoxemia, retention of carbon dioxide, respiratory acidosis. This is going to, again, cause our pulmonary vasoconstriction and uh, pulmonary hypoperfusion, leading to additional injury. So uh, ARDS has a very high mortality. And the way that you'll treat these patients uh, will be with oxygen therapy. They may require mechanical ventilation, as well as anti-inflammatory medication and supportive care. As always, uh, here are a few questions to help you review the material I've just covered. Uh, I hope you have found this useful. Uh, please do subscribe. I sure do appreciate it. Thank you very much and have a great day.